Well, we have Neil as a captive audience. Yesterday was his birthday. So I'd love to sing happy birthday to Neil. Ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Neil. Happy birthday to you. Let's give it up for our amazing pastor. Good job. You guys sounded beautiful. So good. Well, in honor of uh, Labor Day and my birthday, my birthday always is on Labor Day weekend. So imagine that growing up as a kid. That's awesome. I didn't have to go to school on Monday. So great. I wanted to start off with a couple of jokes this morning. Uh, my wife asked me why I wanted to be cremated when I died. And I told her it was my last chance of having a smoking hot body. <laughs> do, you, do you know what kind of workouts lazy people do? Diddly squats. <laughs> Every time I get to work, I hide because good employees are hard to find. <laughs> you start implementing that. Yeah. Stay out of trouble when you hide, don't you? Yeah, yeah so yesterday was my birthday and uh, spent the whole day with my wife and driving around uh, just different locations in the Quad Cities of growing up and living here for majority of my life. And we would always go to Milan Summer Fest as a kid. And so we drove out there to, to Milan to see what that was like now. And it's, you know, when things were so big when you're a kid and then you go and look at them now, it's like, what happened to this? This is not very big at all. And they've moved it out to uh, Camp Milan, uh, Camden Park. And so it used to be downtown Milan. And, and, uh, and the whole day, though, it, it was really fun. We ended the night with uh, going out to um, Princeton, Illinois, has a place where you grill your own steaks. It's like you can do that at your house. But you can also do it at a restaurant and pay a lot more. <laughs> it's great. Do you also get toast and butter? Oh, man, on the grill. I had probably six pieces of toast before I had a steak. It was amazing. So we did that, and they gave me a little piece of cheesecake for my birthday, and that was nice. That was cute. And then, yeah. So I was thinking about this with, with, uh, with life and being 45 and how God repurposes each little area of your life to bring you to where you're at currently in the season of life that you're in. You know, he reuses all the different things of your life constantly for the kingdom of God. And so, you know, the way that you were brought up as a kid, he reuses that. The, the opportunities that you had in employment, he'll reuse those. The way that you interact with people, he uses that. He just constantly is reusing us and using the gifts and talents that he's given us, and he, and he brings us closer and closer to him and, and makes, oh, wow, that makes sense. That's why I work there. And so I was just kind of thinking about that in my old age, 45. Amy asked me this tough question in the morning. I'm like, why did you do that to me? She said, like, Are you, have you accomplished everything that you thought you would at 45? No, <laughs> not at all. No way. You still got time. God has a, a way of just taking people's lives and using them for his glory. And I think you're going to see that in the story of Peter that we're starting today. We're starting the story of Peter and the names of God that Peter uses. And you're going to see that with Peter's life, that God takes his life and reuses his story over and over again to bring people closer to him. So this morning, I'd love to start off with the journey of Peter's life and where he grew up. Peter's family was from a town called Bethsaida. It was a beautiful town that was located on the Galilean Sea. 
There was a tension in the city of this town, though. It was a melting pot for Jews and Hellenistic Jews and Gentiles and Romans all lived in this town because there was a big industry of fishing there. So Peter, from a young age, was not shy to stand up for things that he believed in. He's actually pretty known for getting physical when you argued with them. <laughs> Peter's family trait was fishing. It wasn't something that he grabbed a lawn chair and a fishing pole and a cooler full of cords light to go down the river. <laughs> That's not the type of fishing Peter did. Peter's whole family was a fishing industry. They ran a fishing industry where they ran boats and they had nets and they'd draw in the fish and they'd bring them in and then they'd bring them to market. One thing that came from this industry was taxes. If you own a business in this room, can I get an amen? <laughs> the industry brought taxes. This is his family's trait. And so from the Roman government, you didn't have a bad day of fishing. When you came with your boats, you still got taxed. So when you had a really rough day out there, if business was rough, has anybody else had that? Or you, you have a season or a year of business is horrible. You still got taxed on it. You would come to the shore and the Roman government would, um, a, a soldier would hit you up for, for taxes. So around 25, Peter actually moved to a town, Capernaum, and the rest of his family followed his footsteps and brought the fishing industry to this new town, which was across the river. So this is kind of like moving from Davenport to, say, uh, Buffalo, or, well, across the river. So it'd be more like moving from Davenport to Rock Island. And he brings his entire family over there, and the rest of the family follows, and they move their entire industry of fishing over to Rock Island. It was a move that happened when there was a movement that was happening up the river on the Jordan River that was started by John the Baptist. It was kind of like, imagine a tent revival, but it was on the shoreline. And you had this group of people that normally didn't hang out together nor get along. You had tax collectors, you had Gentiles, you had Jews, and you had Romans. And they were all hanging out and all flocking to John the Baptist up the river. Andrew, who's Peter's brother, goes to join this movement full time. He hears about it and he's excited. I'm going to go see what's happening. And he leaves the industry to go see. In Matthew 3, 1, it gives us a good picture of what's happening led by this John the Baptist. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who has spoken through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness. Prepare the way of, for the Lord and make straight, for, straight paths for him. Now here's a little picture of who, what John the Baptist looked like. John's clothes were made of camel's hair and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. And people went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and all the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins, and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. So this is what Andrew, Peter's brother, leaves the fishing industry to go join. He hears about what's happening there, and all these people are getting baptized. Baptism back then was actually only for Gentiles. So if you were baptized and you wanted to become a Jew, you would have to go get baptized and say, I'm going to take on the Jewish custom. And so when I come out of the water, now I'm a Jew. You're accepted into the Jewish community. But see, this was everybody. This was Jewish people. This was Romans. This was Gentiles. This was everyone that was going to John the Baptist to be baptized. Because John's baptism was different. Repent. Meaning that all of us have had sin in our life. All of us need to be baptized. And so Andrew hears about this and runs to follow John's baptism. 
But Jesus came to be baptized by John the Baptist. I love that about Jesus because everything that Jesus invites you into, he did himself. I'm not great at following people that won't lead by example. Jesus is the perfect example. So even baptism, Jesus is like, I'm going to invite people to be baptized, so I'm going to do it myself. So Jesus gets to be baptized by John the Baptist. And when John saw him, he said, behold, there's the Lamb of God. So this is very different than the other baptisms because John's baptizing people because they need to repent. Jesus is getting baptized because he's the Lamb of God. He's the one that they've all been waiting for. John's been this voice in the wilderness calling out, the one is coming, and here he is. Behold, the Lamb of God. So John baptizes Jesus, and when he baptizes Jesus, two of John's disciples decide to follow Jesus instead of being John's disciples. That's okay. Good choice. <laughs> One of those two disciples was Andrew. Andrew. Peter's brother. He went to go be John's disciple, sees Jesus, I'm following that one. So Andrew runs back as soon as he meets Jesus, as soon as he sees him baptized. In John 41, 1, it says this, the first thing Andrew did was find his brother Simon, who's Peter, and tell him, we have found the Messiah. That is the Christ. So Andrew went on this journey to be John's, John's disciple while Peter's still running the family business. So he goes upriver, goes to follow John. Peter's still running the fishing industry. You know, you might have one of those siblings in your life that are very free-spirited and just decide to go on a whim to do things, Right? Peter is the consistent one still running the fishing industry. He's still taking the boats out. He's still pulling the nets in. He's still coming back. He's still paying the taxes. Andrew's like, I'm going to follow John. There's something happening upriver. And Andrew comes back with this word. We found the one. In the church world, I'd like to say this is kind of like that conference high when you come back from a conference or something really speaks to you at church and you go and try to share it with a brother or sister and who just isn't participating in it and you're trying to share something. We found the one. It's Jesus, the Messiah, the one we've all been waiting for. I found him. Andrew wants his brother to know it's been worth it for me to leave. For me to take off on this adventure, we actually found Jesus. Jesus begins pe teaching people and moving up the shoreline as he's teaching people. So he's moving down the Jordan River teaching people this new way, this, this new way of life, the, the kingdom of God, and he's teaching. And people are flocking by the droves to, to come and hear about this. Andrew and Peter were actually out on the shore one day after being out and not catching any fish. And Jesus gets in their boat with them and says, let down your nets on the other side. Let's look at, it's a verse 5, 1. It says, while Jesus was standing on the lake of Gennesaret, many people pushed to get near him. They wanted to hear the word of God. And Jesus saw two boats on the shore, the fishermen not there because they had been washing their nets. And Jesus got into a boat which belonged to Simon, who was Peter. Jesus asked him to push it out a little way from the land, and he sat down and taught the people on the boat. I just love the, the improvisation of Jesus because they didn't have microphones, they didn't have speakers, but have you ever been out on the water and whatever you say, you know, you can hear, I can hear, we used to have a boat and I could hear like people that were so far away have a conversation. I wonder if they know I can hear them because <laughs> this is a weird conversation they're having over there. But the water, it, 
it magnifies a voice. So Jesus pushes out in the boat so his voice is magnified because the crowd is growing. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, push out on the deep water and then let down your nets for some fish. Simon said to him, teacher, would you say teacher with me? Teacher, teacher. Also rabbi. Teacher, rabbi, same thing. We have worked all night and we have caught nothing, but because you told me, I will let down. I will let my net down. In Peter's experience, there's been other people that have taught, teaching people the way of God. And his view of Jesus at this time was more of a rabbi. He's teaching people on the side of the, on the, side of the shore. Well, this might have looked very differently, but you have this whole movement of people the, from John the Baptist, and they look very differently. I just explained what John the Baptist looked like, and people were going to him. Camel's hair, eating wild honey and locusts. This is where everybody's going. So now you have this new person that says, hey, let down your nets. Let's go out into the deep. Okay, teacher. Whatever you say, we're going to do that. This is interesting because Peter is a professional fisherman. He's already cleaned out his nets. But yet Jesus says, go back out into the deep and then cast your nets on the other side. There's no other side in the fishing boat. <laughs> you know, it, it, the, the net's not going to make a difference on this side or the other side. There's no other side. But Jesus is, is inviting Peter to trust him as a teacher. And then when he follows Jesus' instruction, he actually has a net so full that they couldn't even drag in all the fish. Which is cool because when, we're, when we do something, when we're not directed by God, we find ourselves with empty nets. But then when God directs us to do something and it's God's way of doing it, Cast to the other side, all of a sudden, oh wow, this works. And so Peter has this opportunity to trust Jesus as a teacher. He's willing to do everything at this point. He's running a family business. Remember earlier, you got hit up for taxes whether you had a good day or a bad day. Peter had a really bad day, still having to pay taxes on fish he didn't even catch. Okay, I'll do what you say, Jesus. Verse 6, when they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets started to break. And they called to their friends working in the other boat to come help them. And they came and, the, and both boats were so full of fish that they began to sink. That's a lot of fish. Sounds like Mississippi catfish there. When Simon Peter saw it, he got down at his feet, of, at the feet of Jesus, and he said, Go away from me, Lord. Say Lord with me. Lord. What did Peter call Jesus earlier? Teacher. Teacher go away from me, Lord, because I'm a sinful man. There's a shift. Jesus turned in from, changed from a teacher to a Lord. He and all who were with him were surprised and wondered about the many fish. And James and John and the sons of Zebedee were also surprised. They were working together with Simon. Then, they said, then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. You know, from now on, you will fish for men. And when they came to land with their boats, they left everything and followed Jesus. So the Lord brought them to the very peak of their profession. You didn't have days like this. 
This was the best day ever. The peak of their profession where boats are completely full of fish that they're sinking. You're no longer going to do this. Everything's going to change from this moment on. You're not going to fish for fish anymore, Peter. You're going you're gonna to start fishing for men. And they leave everything and follow Jesus. Not just leave everything, but, you know, so many times I've read that passage over and over, and this is Peter's industry. This is his family trait that's been handed off to him time and time again, and how much investment he's had into this. And Jesus is like, look, I can blow the doors off of this industry, but you're going to leave it all, and you're going to actually follow me now. This is the story of Peter. Jesus actually calls Peter out, and we're going to talk about this a, little, a lot more uh, next week. But Jesus calls Peter out and says, Peter, you're no longer going to be Simon. You're actually going to be Peter. And what that means is I'm going to build my church upon you. You know, when Andrew went down the river to go explore, Peter stayed consistent as a rock. And what the word Peter means is a rock, just like Chevy trucks. <laughs> Man, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Peter's a rock. He's, he's consistent. And Jesus says, I'm going to build my church upon you. Meaning you're going to be the rock in my church so that when things get rough, you're not going to run because I'm going to repurpose your entire life I know where I brought you up. I know what I've invested in you. I know how you lead people. Because Peter's just a natural leader. He was leading an industry of fishermen. Fishermen were tough to lead. I'm going to build my church upon you. You're going to be Peter from now on. Peter's life is forever changed. He leaves his family industry, puts it all on the line to follow Jesus, leaves the boats, leaves the nets, leaves it all. Many times we focus on the changing of Peter's name because that's really interesting. You know, why does God change people's name in the Bible? Have you ever noticed that? So many times the Lord changes people's name. But I'd actually like to focus on what Peter's name to Jesus was. When you change Jesus as a teacher to Jesus as a Lord... Your life will never be the same. When we change Jesus' name from teacher or rabbi to Jesus as Lord, our lives are never the same. When you change Jesus from being your teacher in a learning process that goes on in your head to Jesus as your Lord, your life is never the same. I said that three times. <laughs> Because teachers teach. Teachers teach. And there's good teachers and there's bad teachers. They give us an explanation of past and current events and they teach us that. They teach us history, the science, the, the theology, the Bible study, the commentary that goes along with teaching they give us some thought-provoking insight for us to actually make the decision to follow the teaching. This is what teachers do. And there's good teachers, right? And you're like, oh, thank you so much for teaching me that. I never knew that. Now I'm going to make an educated, educated decision because I have been taught. Teachers teach. So Peter looked at Jesus as a teacher, Thanks, teacher. We're going to go ahead and try. I'm going to trust you. I'll let my nets out on the other side. But Lord is radically different than teacher. Lord is a surrender of our processing, our agendas to learn and to understand everything, and our, our thoughts of what's in it for me and how am I supposed to know what you're leading me into, Lord It costs us. It's, it's humility. It's surrender over to his lordship. 
We can have a lot of great teachers, but when some teachers teach us something that we don't like, we leave the teacher. With the Lord, you can only have one Lord. And there's nowhere else to go. <laughs> so Peter's first calling was not changing Simon to Peter. I'm going to build my church upon you. You're going to be a rock in the church, and you're going to be the start of this. Peter's first calling was calling Jesus Lord. I was calling him Lord. With so many of us wanting to discover our purpose and what's our calling in life, I'm 45 and I'm still trying to figure this out. And maybe when I'm 55, I'm still trying, what is my purpose? What am I supposed to be doing? It's the number one calling for all of us. Jesus is my Lord. He's my Lord. That's the calling. We try to find calling and purpose through things that we do or people that we are. Like, I want to be a great husband. And Amy would definitely say, I'm amazing at it. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Praise Jesus. Amen. Yes. <laughs> Birthday weekend. Yeah, ask her next week. <laughs> and I want to be a great father, right? I mean, you want to be a great, you want to be a great father. You want to be a good spouse. You, you want to be a good employee, You want to do your best and, you know, if you, if you run a business, like you, you want your business to succeed. It's like I feel this calling to, to lead an industry. And sometimes those things get so confusing when, when our calling becomes our Lord. When the calling becomes the Lord, and the Lord is, is, is the Lord is Jesus, and sometimes we, we follow this calling, Peter, you're going to be a rock. I'm going to build my church upon you. Oh, man, I'm going. And sometimes we just leave Jesus in the boat. <laughs> I'm going to build Jesus' church. And our calling, our calling is to call Jesus our Lord. And to say, Jesus, you know, whatever you want to do with my life, I surrender everything. You know, if I don't understand it, it's okay because I trust you. And so we have Peter, and, and you're going to discover so much of Peter's life. And if you wanted to base your life off a disciple in the Bible, Peter is so such a great example of what it's like to be all in for the kingdom of God. He really is. But this shift for him was not changing of his name. The shift was Peter going, you're no longer a teacher. In fact, you're my Lord. And I'm just going to follow you wherever you want to leave, Lord. One thing that I've learned in the last 45 years of my life is when I hear people pray and they use the word Lord in their prayers, man, those are people that are really, really dedicated to God's, God's leading. The word Lord says, I completely surrender whatever it is that you want to do in my life. I completely surrender it over to you, Lord. It's such a great word for us to grab a hold of and say, Jesus is my Lord. Yes, he's my Savior. Yes, he's, he's other things. But he, first off, the very first calling that I have is Lord. And if we call Jesus Lord, everything good in life will flow out of that. I want to give you a couple of examples of what will happen when you call Jesus Lord. It will help you from not letting your purpose become something that calls you away from church community when Jesus becomes your Lord. Because Jesus says, Lord, what it does is it actually trumps everything else. And so sometimes our purpose becomes the thing that we are attracted to so much 
and it calls us away from all the great things that God has invited us into. When we call Jesus Lord, it, it helps us discover that our purpose will never go against what the Bible told us. And one, one thing that it really helps us out in, when we call Jesus the Lord and we surrender to Jesus as Lord, our call will never become our Lord. The purpose will never become our Lord. I, I just want to share really honestly, I've seen this in ministry so many times that, that, the, that the call of a pastor or worship leader or children's director or youth director or the call to plant a church becomes the Lord. And everything is on the line for the call or the purpose. And Jesus is just waiting for us to come back to him and call him Lord. And we're out there trying to pull in nets of fish. And Jesus is like, yeah, just let me get in the boat again with you. Let me steer the ship. And I've seen that a lot in, in, in raising kids, too, that are kids. We want to do a great job as parents. And being a parent becomes the Lord. And we find ourselves so all over the place trying to chase down whatever makes our kids happy. But when we call Jesus Lord, as Peter did, it completely changes everything. He becomes our calling. He's the original calling. I'd like to end with one thing that Peter says at the end of calling Jesus Lord. He says, depart from me because I'm a sinful man. Depart from me because I'm sinful. And I think a part of that is he's, Andrew, his brother, went to go chase this down, right? And he also heard about Jesus, and he continued to fish. Depart from me. I, I've heard about you. My brother went to chase you down. And here I am just doing what I'm doing. But here's the coolest part of it all is Jesus went and found Peter and got in the boat with him. And that's how Jesus operates, is he chases us down. And I just think about all the things that could have been left on the table as we jump into the story of Peter. You're going to discover there's Peter led the way for so many people to believe in Jesus. And he, he gave great teachings, and he was bold, and, he, and he, he was used by God to heal people. All that could have just been left on the table. Depart from me, I'm a sinful man. Not me, like you, somebody else, God. But when you call Jesus Lord, what that means is you're actually saying, Jesus, go ahead and use me for your glory. And so today I just want to say this is if you've ever felt that way, maybe God wants to use somebody else. Oh, I've seen people on the stage who God's using, or maybe I've watched some YouTube, I've seen some people that have really been used by God. It's you. It's you. He, he loves to use you. You. For his glory. For, for your life. That's his life. He wants to use you. Whether you've made a hundred thousand mistakes in life, Jesus sees beyond that and he's forgiven you of that and he, he wants to use your life. The dreams he's given you. He wants to use us. So this morning, what I'd love to do is just apply this in, in a simple way of, maybe you've heard this in the past of calling Jesus Lord, but um, maybe you got distracted. I know sometimes I get really distracted. I'm just coming back to Jesus, just saying, you know what, Jesus, just be my Lord again. My everything, just... Lead the way. Whatever you want to lead me in. Maybe some things have came up and you're thinking, Jesus, Jesus wants to use somebody else. I've made too, too big of a, um, a hurdle for him to cross in my life. It's, it's just not true. 
Jesus wants to be your Lord today. He wants to use your life. So let's just pray. Lord, I thank you that you're in the boat this morning, that um, for this Labor Day weekend, Lord, the, the people uh, that, that are here this morning, that you are with us. You, you have shown up. You're with us, God. He's right here. Lord, we just choose to call you Lord this morning. Be the king of our hearts. Be the Lord of our lives. Whatever you want to do, God, we just, we just choose to surrender over to you. The things that we know, the things that we can understand, and the things that we don't know and don't understand, Lord, we just choose to surrender them over to you, Jesus. Be our Lord. Use our lives, God. You repurpose areas of our life that... Um, have felt really distant, repurpose those areas. Lord, use us in our workplace this week. Use us in our family this week, Lord, to bring your light. Use us with our family and our, our friends and our neighborhoods. Lord, would you just use our lives? We surrender over to you as our Lord. Whatever you want to do, Lord. Lord, we thank you for your word that's alive and living, that we can um, tap into the goodness of God and, and see how people have uh, for years and years and decades and decades just, just followed you and, and left everything, Lord. And, and you took care of everything from there. And so, Lord, I just pray for, for any of us in this room that uh, you've been inviting us to just cast our nets to the other side, to just trust in, in your direction or whether it's a, a been a, a great season for us to, to just come to an end of a season and just be able to say, you know what, this, this is the best season I've ever had. And I'm going to choose to just uh, follow God in this direction from here. Whatever it is, Lord, I just pray for faith in this room, for, for any of us in this room that just, um, you've been inviting us to just trust you in new seasons new direction. Hmm. New faith. Just trusting you. Hmm. Amen. Well, if that hit home with any of you guys, I'd love to, we have some time to uh, just invite you up and get some prayer. Sherry will be up here to, well, no, she won't. I'll be up here to pray with you. If you'd like to sign up for the spiritual formation night, that's, I'm inviting you. That's going to be super fun, great insight, good teaching. It should be really good. Yeah, just go to the back table. If you're a first-time guest, please stop at Guest Central. Hey, would you stand up with me? Let's just go ahead and close out with this passage that we love to read. Therefore, go and make disciples in all the nations and baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit 
and then teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, that I am with you always, even to the end of the world.